rewards that a user can spend on iTunes uh, downloads. In 2012, she was elected to participate in the Accelerator Program, a program in partnership with Ohio State, Ohio's new entrepreneurs, one, fund and private investment dollars to create the Endo Kids app which rewards both young children with insulin-dependent diabetes and their parents. Dr. Dry, uh, Dyer is also an experienced nutrition researcher focused on diabetes development and behavior change. Fellowship, following fellowship training from 2006 to 2011, she practiced pediatric endocrinology and was a principal investigator at Nationwide uh, Children's Hospital affiliated with the Ohio State University in uh, Columbus, Ohio, where she also earned her uh, master's in public health degree in health behavior studies in 2008. She received her medical degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio in 2000, which was then followed by pediatric internship, residency, and then pediatric endocrinology specialty training in 2000 to 2006, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas. Please help me welcome Dr. Uh, Jennifer Shine Dyer. Please feel free to interrupt and ask me questions as we go along. Um, I'm going to be telling you about technology in general, um, how it's integrated into my life, because I think when you're using technology to integrate into patients' lives, you have to ask yourself, how has it integrated into my life? So I'm gonna start out telling you about that, as well as social media, how to use it, and some tips and, and uh, tips of the trade, so to say, and then um, conclude by showing you how you can use apps to engage patients. So, just in brief, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. I have a master's of public health and ha health behavior change. And I'm a problem solving technology entrepreneur, which actually as a doctor solving problems is what we always do. So it actually is a natural extension to be a technology entrepreneur as the way I see it. And I'm also a social media enthusiast. Um, I had a little patient that I used to call a pink lady because she liked to wear pink and sparkly all of the time. But she would call me her endo, like all of my patients would call their endocrinologist their endo, and she called me endo goddess because I like to wear sparkly too. So that's kind of where the name came from, and it's just kind of taken on a life of its own, which I'll tell you more about. But to start with, I'm gonna tell you my story about technology and how it's integrated into my life because this helps me understand better how it can integrate into my patient's life and how it has an emotional component as well. So once upon a time, Jennifer was born to a happy couple in Dallas, Texas. In 1972, right before I was born, this is the first time that a modeling of a mobile system to break into the phone was actually first started wouldn't be until 10 years later that a commercial mobile phone was available. But prior to that, our family got our first family computer in 1980, an Apple II Plus, if you guys might remember that. And with a floppy disk, I used to like to play games and I would use formulas to write my name in computer graphics. And I thought that was really fun. And it was, we got our computer right the same day that the Dallas Who Shot JR came out. So I always remembered that. And maybe that's why it was always a positive connotation to me, technology, because it was always exciting. And a year later, I found myself watching the first video on MTV. I was, my parents said, oh yeah, you can watch MTV. And then a year later, they said, no, that's bad. So I couldn't watch it anymore. But in 1981, I was playing Atari while I was watching MTV. Um, we had two TVs upstairs, and um, I was playing my favorite game, Pitfall, because I thought the graphics were the best. <laughs> and uh, I used to, and I was always a nerdy 
bit, a bit of a nerdy child. Um, on the weekends, I used to enter Pong programming contests in my area. And um, basically, we'd try to program it the fastest. So I didn't ever win, but I always thought it was really fun. And around this time in 1981 is when you started seeing the portable units for mobile phones. And these were called luggables or transportables. And they were large mainly because of the size of the battery. But it was in 1983 that the first commercially available mobile phone was available. And it was invented by Motorola. And Motorola, in 1983, released it. There were 300,000 units that were sold. They were almost $4,000 each. The battery only lasts for eight hours, and it was as heavy as a bag of sugar. Around this time, in 1984, I was programming my synthesizer and, <laughs> and trying to uh, be cool, obviously was not successful. But, um, and then I was listening to my Walkman. But I really liked my, my synthesizer because I could program things, and I could add tracks on top of each other. And so this gave me a really positive connotation to technology as well. And I was also doing the robot <laughs> in my jazz class. <laughs> but in 1988 is when really the, the phone was becoming, the, the cell phone or mobile phone was really becoming part of pop culture. This is in the Olympics that one of the Olympians is calling his family members after he won a gold medal. But really the biggest changes in mobile came in 1989 with the release of digital phones. And the digital networks led to a large increase of use for mobile phones. And all of the mobile phones actually were, had dark gray or black colors, and they had aerials and small screens. It wasn't until 1993 that the first smartphone was available. And in, it was made by IBM. It was sold in 1993. And it was a mobile phone, basic computer, a pager, and a fax machine. And it cost $900. Did anybody have one of those? I, I didn't. Um, in 1994, um, so around this time that the first smartphone came out, I didn't have a smartphone. I was opening my first email account in the college computer lab, where at you know, at four in the morning when you're doing your paper and you meet the blue screen of death. This was a very traumatizing experience. But in 1996, that's the first year I went to medical school, uh, the mobile internet connection was first available on phones. And it was first through the Nokia phone. And it looked like a normal phone, but a really big, thick phone. And uh, it was really slow connecting to the internet, and it had a full keyboard on it. But I really never used a cell phone until I got married and started my intern year in 2000. So when I was an intern, and I wanted to talk to my husband because I wasn't at home very much, then I would use the cell phone to his cell phone because it was free. And that was really, for me, the first time I ever used a mobile phone where more than just calling for an emergency. So in my medical training technology, this was being on call in the NICU, where we had three pagers. We had one for the NICU, one for the newborn nursery, and one for labor and delivery. We'd also have these radio communicators to tell us to go to emergency C-sections. And then we would also have the phone operator be a backup just in case this technology didn't work. And there was no electronic medical record at that time at Parkland. And we still were able to practice medicine without it, but um, it was really hard to sleep in these bunk beds with the three pagers and the, the radio connector. But um, that was the, my experience of technology as a training resident. And I was one of the early adopters to get a BlackBerry, which really still surprises me that it's, it was in 2002 that it first was even available. And it was manufactured in, and is still manufactured in 
Canada. And it had email, you could surf the internet, you could fax and have phone services all in one device. And it really wasn't until 2006 that camera phones really became as common and ubiquitous as they are now. That's pretty amazing to think about that that was only six years ago and now we all pretty much use our, our phones for our cameras. And I find it fascinating how quickly what's really natural to me now has, has changed. And in 2007, texting, there, there started to, to become texting contests for kids. And this is one elicited in 2007. But 2007 is the first time I ever sent a text of any kind. Um, my little cousin here holding my dog, Sadie, when she went to college, she wanted to text me and show me pictures of bug bites or things that wondered if, if she needed to worry about them. So I said, okay, Molly, I'll, I'll text you. And she was the only person I texted, and now I text all the time. So that was only five years ago. So around that time, on my Master's of Public Health, my program um, had a, a practicum that we would do a, a project and I did my project writing online and for the internet um, for health literacy. So around this time, um, I started realizing the power of writing on the internet and just consumer writing to reach general health literacy. And a year later is when the iPhone 3G came out and that's when I got my first iPhone. And the 3G is faster and cheaper than its predecessor. And in 2008, I started Twitter, um, my account on Twitter, which I'll, I'll tell you more about in detail. I also started blogging at endogoddessblogspot.com, which I'll also tell you more about. And I started a YouTube channel just because I wanted to be creative about some of my health literacy efforts. And so um, just started a, a YouTube channel at that time. And I then started texting my patients because I thought, well, I'm texting all my friends and family who ask me about medical things all the time. I might as well text my patients. So obviously that wasn't a scalable solution for helping with medication adherence with my patients. So in 2010, a medical student and I who met over social media started planning and developing an app together. So we made our first app in 2010, and we just read how to make apps for dummies. Um, it, but given my technology background and his technology background, it, it was, we just thought we could do it, I guess. But um, we made a really simple app, which I'll tell you about. And then I decided to become an entrepreneur, and in 2011, released the Indo Goddess app, and just last month released the Indogoal app, and I'll tell you more about these. So, and we're gonna start by talking about social media. 83% of all, actually it's, it's a larger number now, but by Pew Internet data, that 83% of people search for information about health online. So it made sense to me in my Masters of Public Health classes when I learned about this fact that it would be very beneficial to be out there and creating information that's accurate for my patients. And also based on Pew Internet data, that 60% of e-patients or empowered um, internet patients said that that health information that they looked up online affected their treatment decisions, affected their attitude toward treatment decisions. But it was really my friend Brian Vardabidian at Texas Children's Hospital that really is the one that talked me into getting active in social media. So this is his Twitter name, Dr. V, uh, underscore V. And he's a pediatric gastroenterologist. And he said, Jen, think about this. There are 60,000 people in the Academy of Pediatrics. If each member submitted one science-based entry on autism and vaccines that could be elicited online, then science would show up before Jenny McCarthy first on Google search for autism and vaccines. And I thought that was really a powerful argument that, okay, 
And actually, social media is an easier way to get that online footprint. So these are some of the ways that you can influence that search. So you can influence by having your own blog. You can also do a podcast, um, be active on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, writing web-based content. And there are also online community participation that, that is a really active way to be an advocate, which I'll tell you all about these. So I started a blog on Blogspot, which is just an extension of Google. So I have my Gmail account, and I can easily get onto Blogspot. But if this is a little bit advanced, one thing that's a little bit easier is that there is a share care platform. This is Dr. Oz's platform, where he gives you the template, and you just have to write the content. So this is one easy way as well. So you can write off to get your profile for share care, and they basically just make sure that you're really a doctor or a nurse, and that's kind of how they make sure that the content is quality content, and this gets a lot of searches. And this blogging is just editorial writing, and it's your, it's your writing. Um, it's kind of like the same that you might do an editorial letter for a peer review journal. Um, another option is podcasting. I happen to be at a nationwide children's hospital where an ex-DJ pediatrician had his own um, you know, studio at home in the garage. So um, he invited me to be part of it. Um, but he actually, and I, I'm not doing it anymore, but it's called PediaCast, and he's, they're really good shows, and it's basically talking about what, what are the headlines in the week that a lot of parents will actually look at, at these, and it's an in-depth conversation. And also involvement in online communities. This is the Diabetes Social Media Advocacy Community. And this is a really powerful way to help clarify good information for people with diabetes. And what I mean by an online community are Twitter chats. Now, a Twitter chat is, these are some of the ones that are outlined. They happen, they're moderated chats, and you use a hashtag on Twitter, and that's how you become part of the chat, and that's how the, you, you can search and filter the chat. And these chats occur every week. So the one at Sunday at 9 o'clock Eastern time is healthcare social media. This is really how I've met everybody that I've met with social media. It's a way to filter the noise of social media to be with these moderated chats. So what they do is they, they pick, there's a moderator that picks three topics and ask a question to everybody participating and everybody says what they think. So it's whatever, and, and you can submit what, if you'd like a topic to the moderator, and it's, it's a controlled way to have a discussion. On Mondays at nine o'clock is the breast cancer social media chat, and this has become, this was a great a source to find out what real people think about the S Susan Cohen kind of controversy that was going on, you could really tell what real people thought. And, and I use it as a real way to tell what people are thinking and what they understand about different concepts for health literacy. This is, on Wednesdays at 8 o'clock is the Society for Participatory Medicine. This is where really engaged patients and doctors that are very interested in patient-centered care will come and discuss the difficulties or challenges of participatory medicine. And on Wednesdays at 9 o'clock is the Diabetes Social Media Advocacy Chat. And this is led by, uh, Diabetes has the largest online community in, of of all of the health conditions. So this is a really powerful way to, to see what people with diabetes are struggling with. mHealth is mobile health, um, so that's, that's a mobile health chat. 
And then medical education is one that I thought that you guys would think is pretty interesting as well. Some of the challenges in academic medicine, training, and how to best um, move forward into the next um, new era of medical ed education. And then there's a health IT, social media chat as well, talking about some of the new things that are coming out and what's good about some things, what's bad about other things. Um, and just reacting to the different um, policies that come out with meaningful use. So this is a great way, an easy way. It's only an hour once a week to get involved, and you're, it's a powerful way to really meet a lot of other advocates. And you can find a lot of other chats on simpler.com. So it's S-Y-M-P-L-U-R.com, and that's another way that you can keep track of your metrics with Twitter and how many reaches that you have if, if you're into the data of it. But social networks are becoming now peer review. They're very powerful for behavior change, but it's just really a human factor. I learned, really first learned about the power of social networks by volunteering in diabetes camp. The power of being with other people that have something like you have is very powerful. And so, in the archives of internal medicine, they kind of outline a lot of available social networks that are specific to diabetes, but you can all, it's starting to become more common with other conditions as well. So a lot of people ask, well, Jen, how much time do you spend doing this? Well, I really spend about an hour a day. So I might tweet um, in the morning, at lunch and at the end of the day, and I'll do one of the Twitter chats once a week. So, I mean, it seems like I do a lot, but an hour a day really isn't that much, but it's still, I mean, time is money, right, um, as doctors. And we have a lot of things that are competing for our time. But I will tell you that in the future, there's a return on investment with the accountable care organizations that there is a part of accountable care organizations about how activated our patients are. And activating them and measuring them, um, measuring the effect that you have through social media is certainly something that can fit into that model. Accountable care organizations have not occurred yet for most of us, but this is the idea. So I think that there is a future for return on investment with social media, but right now there is not. But there's also return on investment for meaningful use, uh, stage two. So this means that hospitals that are able to have their patients be able to view their data will and interact with their data are going to get reimbursed more. So um, this is actually through the VA system, the Blue Button in Initiative. And it's essentially, it puts all of the patient's medical information in a PDF. And so it is legal for the VA to give a patient their medical information. And that's what this meaningful use, the next stage is going to start um, giving more reimbursement whenever you can give information to patients about their own medical record. Other benefits, return on investment, why do this, is that it gives you a way to control your digital footprint. All of us as patients, ourselves, look up our doctors. I mean, almost everybody does. So um, it gives you a way to control what's being said about you, and it's you saying it instead of somebody else. So it's powerful in that way. It allows you, the whole reason I'm here getting to talk to you is because of this. And it's exciting to be able to create the future of medicine the way that we want to see it. And you also get direct feedback and interaction with the Twitter chats to see what people living with a chronic condition, what their real challenges are. And it's also fun. I mean, why do anything if it's not fun? So it's, it's really fun and rewarding. I've really gotten to learn a lot of things that, and benefits that I didn't realize I would have. And it's also new opportunities for networking. If you're doing any academic collaborations, you can meet lots of other people that are of the same mindset and there have actually been a lot of papers and um, academic uh, you know, collaborations that led to awesome projects.
And you can also participate in federal and state advocacy to make healthcare the way that we want it to be and going to conferences and meetings like we are here today. And I will tell you, as far as some studies that came about through these interactions on Twitter, this is one survey that should be out in the Journal of Medical Internet Research soon. But this was a survey of doctors, both MD and DO, and that are oncologists as well as primary care. So they looked at 186 oncologists as well as 299 primary care doctors looked at how many years since medical school, how many patients they see per week, what the practice location, the practice setting, if it's solo, group, or, or medical school, and do they do a lot of direct care, patient care. And most of them, 97%, 98%, all did direct patient care. So they wanted to look at their social media activity. And if you look here, you see right here is that, um, that these are current users, okay? So email, a lot of them are using email. And then it goes on down here. So whether they use online communities, like restricted online communities for physicians, like Sermo, or texting, cell phone apps, iTunes, Wikipedia, YouTube, Facebook, blogs, LinkedIn, Twitter, and RSS feeds. What you see is that every, I'll just summarize here, that everyone has heard of email, so almost everyone is using email. A lot of people don't know about LinkedIn or RSS feeds. You see that some people said they are never, ever, ever going to use Twitter or Facebook. And whenever you look at professional versus personal use of social media, you see that most of the time for physicians, they're using social media for personal, not professional, except for podcasting. Most people do podcasting for professional reasons and not for personal. But what I think is really interesting is when you look at media usage since medical school, it does tend to skew on the younger side for texting, email, podcasting, blogs, RSS, and cell phone apps, but the really most social of all the media, which is Facebook and Twitter, is age independent. So it's really not necessarily the younger people that are doing Facebook and Twitter. And whenever you look at this recent report that came out about the growth of social media transactions amongst doctors, it's grown a lot. So I started right here, and now it's really grown a lot. So people are it's starting to catch on. And when you look at who's digitally active as far as specialists, there's a reason I'm an endocrinologist here. There are a lot of endocrinologists that are active, as well as cardiologists and oncologists. And really, I would say it does seem this way as far as who are the most active. It, it is mostly endocrinologists and oncologists is my experience. And when you look at what they're doing by channel, most of the people that are active in social media are doing blogs. And the reason is because Twitter, you can only have 140 characters. But Twitter is really easy. But a blog is kind of for you to just go on a pontification, kind of rant a little bit. And so that's what people do on blogs. And it's more of an educated rant is what it typically is. A lot of people use Facebook still more personally, and that, that would be true for me. I don't use it professionally. LinkedIn is, is certainly a way to network from a business standpoint, I would say. Um, and Twitter is still not being really aggressively used, and YouTube is being used a lot um, because videos can be powerful. So just, I just wanted to leave you um, with a few tips before we start talking about apps. That in general, the same rules that you follow on an elevator are the ones that you should follow on social media. So we're not ever supposed to talk about patients on an elevator. So you're not ever supposed to talk about patients on social media. It's also important to know HIPAA in general um, and the, just the general principles of HIPAA. But I will tell you that if you're not sure about should you 
say something on Twitter or Facebook or any of the social media, first of all, don't say it if you even have a question. But if you really want to learn about what is good and not good to say on fa Twitter and Facebook, make sure that you consult with legal early and often. I feel like consulting with legal is similar to consulting with the ethics board about questions that are hard to answer. Um, and they encourage that in a lot of organizations. So learning legal at your organization and talking to them is very much encouraged. But I can tell you that these are two resources on Twitter, David Harlow, and he's, a, he's in Boston, and he works with Boston Children's. He's a lawyer. And then Dan Goldman is a lawyer at Mayo Clinic for the, and all he does is social media. So he does social media for legal for Mayo Clinic. They're very good, and they're at least somebody you could ask if you don't, if you don't know who to ask at your organization. But they're very, this is a, another great use of Twitter that you have these great resources to just ask them a general question and that can help you get in the right direction. And they have blogs too, but these are their Twitter names. So another thing that um, is helpful with social media is to use policies to limit your liability. And what I mean by this, this is Dr. Keeley Combs. So psychologists actually and psychiatrists have even a higher bar of privacy compared to an endocrinologist. And actually Dr. Keeley Combs is a psychologist and she has developed her own social media policy and that she gives to her patients. So she gives them expectations, like I'm not gonna friend you, or um, makes it really clear. And she's actually consulted a lot um, by doctors because her policy is so well written and she's really gotten uh, lawyers to work with her to make sure that it's, it's ironclad. So you can actually look up her, this is her webpage if you wanna look at her social media policy. And I think she has one of the best social media policies. And it's all about transparency and just setting out from the beginning with your patient about what they can expect and not expect about you on social media. And this is me with one of my patients. Do not ever practice medicine online. So um, even if, uh, I mean, She's one of my patients, so I could technically talk to her, um, but really I'm usually gonna take a conversation offline. And even when I'm at the airport and somebody asks me, should I use Tylenol or Motrin? I can't answer that question because I don't know if they've had a kidney transplant. I don't know if they've had a liver transplant. So I can't ever answer that question, even a simple question like that. So that's practicing medicine. So you can't practice medicine online. But also on your pages, whenever you have a blog, whenever you have Twitter or Facebook, make sure you watch the conversations. It is social media because it's social. So you have to watch it and you have to scan and scrub on your pages. Sometimes people are mean online and so you just have to kind of and take off their comments um, if they're just trying to be mean. And interacting daily is pretty critical for social media to have the real impact. It's, it's social for because it's social media. But also, uh, take conversations off the runway, offline. So I kind of have a rule, if I'm talking to somebody more than three times, like a back and forth, then that's, that's usually when I should take the conversation offline. That's just one rule, but it's, it's good to initiate conversations and ideas, but really take the in-depth conversations offline. So moving on to patient engagement and apps, but first of all, does anybody have any questions about social media? Go ahead. So your question is, what is the content of tweeting? And uh, for me, um, so I set up my tweeting to be all about things that people ask me about the most. So I would say that that's kind of a gauge about how to know what to tweet about, that your patients are asking you about and that you are always answering. I'm the only doctor in my family, the only medical 
person. So there are kind of always typical questions that people ask me. And that's partly where the content comes from, just my friends and family. And I just say, you know, clarify what's accurate, what's not accurate about headlines. And I also, I started talking about a little bit of personal things that I like fashion. Um, that's why on my Twitter account, I'm a stylish pediatric endocrinologist. <laughs> because I thought, I, I felt like I would think it was more interesting to get on Twitter three times a day if I, if I had a little bit of personal fun too. So, um, and I also talk about food, like um, I'm a foodie, so talk about, oh, I went to this awesome place, and oh, I'm cooking, it's, I have this awesome butternut squash recipe. It, it's kind of random what I talk about, and what I blog about, I blog about, my blog is a stylish pediatric endocrinologist adventures in mobile health. So everything about that I'm learning as I go. And all of this is learn. I mean, I'm a protagonist in my own adventure of life. <laughs> and so that's kind of always the content, I would say, for me. But it, for a lot of people, it's, it's very different. So it's, I say being the protagonist about whatever is your adventure that you're the most passionate about. And it makes it, makes it more fun to talk about the content that way. And so it can be a lot of different things. Um, I love Pinterest. <laughs> and so I'm one of the only women in technology, and, um, and I'm the only woman at my startup, and there are all these like young college kids wearing hoodies and everything. And they're like, they don't understand Pinterest at all, and they're always asking me about Pinterest. Like, why do you like Pinterest? I love Pinterest. I get like in, transfixed by it. And um, I just use um, Pinterest, if there's a pretty picture of a butternut squash, I mean, that's kind of what I do with it. I don't know what I'm doing with it exactly, but I like, I mostly just use it for fashion. I don't really use it professionally yet, but great question. <laughs> Any other questions before I go on? Okay. So the problem, as I mentioned, I'm a problem-solving technology entrepreneur. And the problem is adherence. These are awesome treatments for diabetes, but they don't work unless you take them. So just to review that um, intensive basal bolus therapy for in pediatrics, most everybody is on insulin, whether you have type 2 or type 1. So, and almost everybody is on intensive basal bolus therapy, so prandial boluses as well as basal insulin. In a lot of my patients that are on pumps, even though it's really easy for them to press the ACT blue button for boluses, they still don't. And the reason I know that is because I'll have them download their pump to um, a USB port at their home computer and also download their meter. And I can see right here every time, and I blurred everything out, um, so I can see when they skip their boluses. And they skip them about 50% of the time, a lot of times. And the barriers to bolus adherence really are complex. Um, a lot of the kids that, that do this are really great kids. They have really great families, but um, diabetes is just hard. But also, sometimes the kids, even teenagers that seem aloof and like they don't care. Um, they're worried about their parents when they lost their jobs in Ohio, this big recession, um, people losing jobs and they worry about their parents having to buy extra insulin and that maybe they could save some insulin by not bolusing. They also, sometimes they just don't understand, but I, I try to really clarify that. Sometimes they like to cause conflicts with their family over their diabetes, so they'll have high blood sugars depression, adjustment disorder. There's also an eating disorder called diabulimia where you actually skip your boluses to lose weight. And sometimes teenagers just forget. And a lot of times though, most of, a lot of times it's that they're afraid that they're gonna have a low blood sugar in public or when they're driving. And then it just becomes a habit to just skip the boluses and peer pressure. So it's, it's pretty complicated. It's more than just forgetting. So, 
I thought, you know, I might as well just start texting my patients um, and see if that helps them give them a little bit more support, but also increase their mindfulness for their boluses. And really, how did I think of that? Well, this is one of my friend's pictures of their kids from Facebook. <laughs> like, all the kids in this picture are all on devices, even this kid right here. So um, I might as well be there, too, is what I thought. Yes. <laughs> so this is just like, you know, going out to dinner, you know. Like, this is life right now. So it, it was just me thinking, well... Dr. Dyer should be there too. So Dr. Dyer did. So um, it also is true that teenagers text a lot. They text 50 times a day on average, and I imagine that that number is higher. This was a year and a half ago. And when you look at the demographics of teen cell phone users, you see what's interesting, that there are some disparities, but they're not as many. It's not as high of a disparity as you would imagine. So poverty level, about 60% of teenagers use the phone and, or have a phone versus 87% over 75,000 a year. So there is a little difference, but it's not that big. And when you see whether well, most teenagers have unlimited texting plans, so a lot of their parents don't, the teenagers do, because it makes economic sense. And what's interesting to note from Pew Internet data is that Hispanics are a large group, more than any other group that texts, actually, and that they use their phones to go online because they don't necessarily always have a home computer. So phones are a really big life source for a lot of families. So hypothesis that I used, personalized interactive engagement with me, their doctor, once a week would help increase their mindfulness. So just that I would just be sort of this floating entity in their texting phone <laughs> and reduce hemoglobin A1C within three months. It was really the end goal. So I would be an initial greeting message, customized question that would be a personal question, like how's band going, how is, um, four-wheeling going, and then I would give them my nagging question, like, well, how are you doing with your boluses? How are you doing with your glucose? And then I'd give them a concluding message, like um, if they had a hard week, I'd say, I know you had a hard week, but I know you can do better next week, or congratulations, you had a great week. So those were kind of the two main things I would say. So what I found is that with my first three patients, so their hemoglobin A1Cs were high because they were skipping their boluses, and they went from 11 to 9 and 8%. So, and all I did was that simple texting protocol, and it increased their mindfulness. So I'm gonna show you a little video. Even while she's alone reading quietly on the couch, Kaylin Wallace is balancing a busy social schedule. Her friends and family are as close as her phone, and Kaylin rarely loses touch. My phone's never turned off. It's always on. Uh, I have between, I've had uh, cell phone bills, 5,000 to 7,000 text messages a month. All that texting takes time and sometimes affects Kaylin's health. Kaylin has diabetes and several times a day needs to check her blood sugar levels and give herself insulin treatments called boluses. But with so much going on, it's easy to forget a trend Kaylin's doctor noticed with several of her patients. Most of them missed anywhere between 9 and 11 boluses per week, that being that there are only three usually per day. So they really were not taking the majority of their boluses. So Dr. Jennifer Dyer of Nationwide Children's Hospital had an idea. Since so many of her teen patients spend so much of their time texting, why not join them? In a small pilot study, Dyer, who's also with Ohio State University, sent text messages to her patients reminding them to take their medicine. And in a short time, saw a big difference. The teens were three times less likely to miss a dose. At the end of the texting period, which was three months, they were only missing three or four a week. It worked so well, Dyer is now applying for grants to expand her texting study to include 50 more patients. Kaylin hopes the idea catches on with other doctors because that connection, she says, however it happens, is important. I'm leaving for college soon, so I'm under a lot of stress and 
I think the little reminders just help. At Nationwide Children's Hospital, this is Clark Powell reporting. So I created the Bolus Reminder app, which is basically to automate the texting protocol that I did. Um, the only person that would need an app would be a physician, and that the patients would not need an app. They just need to be able to receive texts. So, however, what I found is that as I was making this app, and as I was doing that video, um, I found that actually my patients started skipping their boluses again. And I asked them what they needed, and they said, well, Dr. Dyer, we really like it when you're texting us. We like you and we like, um, you know, how you care about us, but we just need more reminders than once a week. And we also need motivation and we hate diabetes and sometimes feel like our fr friends and family don't really understand how hard it is. So I looked at health behavior models and BJ Fogg's health behavior model is the one that kept getting my attention. His behavior model is that you can sustain a positive health behavior when you use a technology to do three things. The technology that I was using was triggering or reminders, and, but I wasn't doing the other two things, and that's why it didn't last. So the technology needs to provide a motivation as well as an ability for that behavior. So lots of information and education about that behavior. So I took a leap of faith. I wasn't getting anywhere with getting grants, so I turned to the capitalistic system because I knew I could get money that way um, and started Duet Health Partnership, um, a startup with uh, two guys in Columbus, Ohio, and started the Endo Goddess Company as well. And I spent last summer coding the Endo Goddess app to incorporate BJ Fogg's health behavior model. So what it does is that it provides motivation by giving rewards. So iTunes rewards once a week. There are also motivating quotes for a chronic condition on the first page. The purpose of the app is to be a glucose journal. So the behavior that I chose, instead of the boluses, I chose glucose checks. So my hypothesis is that if you do the hardest behavior, which is glucose checking, then your mindfulness for bolus and medication adherence will go along with that because it's not as hard as the glucose checking. So the journal is for glucose checking. And there you can set alarms and reminders or triggers to give your phone an alarm to tell you that it's time to take your blood sugar check. There's also lots of information, multimedia content about how to check your blood sugars, as well as how to get involved in social media and find the social support that you need. And finally, in BJ Fogg's health behavior model, it provides motivation with iTunes rewards and social daily motivational quotes that are entered by the user. This is, and who pays for the iTunes is actually your friends and family. So you get support from your friends and family, which is a social business model. So basically your friends and family give you money and that's where the money comes from. So we have a thousand users right now and we're really excited by that. But a thousand users and 99 sits an app does not make a living. So we make apps for Ohio Health Hospital System, as well as Nationwide Children's, Children, Children's Hospital Boston, CDC, Health Map, and Cardinal Health. Um, they pay us to um, make apps for them, and that's how we make a living. But I'm seeking a new and inventive way to get money because um, have to be adaptive in these hard times. So um, crowdfunding is a way that I'm doing that. And this is, I'm trying to raise $5,000 to do a clinical trial. And I'll show you a video that I made. Hey guys, do you know anyone with diabetes? Or do you have diabetes yourself? Well, I'm Dr. Jen Dyer. I'm an endocrinologist, a diabetes doctor, and I know diabetes sucks. But together with a startup here in Columbus, Ohio, Duet Health, 
I've made an app to make diabetes a little easier. We've invested our own resources to take it to the level that it's at, which is released in the App Store on Apple and on Android. And it's gotten international and national acclaim for its innovative design. But we need to take it to the next level, which is making some more edits, getting some of the bugs out of the technical aspect of the app, making it as special as we know that it is. It provides a journal for people with diabetes to write down their blood sugars. Now that's not special, but what's special about it is getting reward points. So every time you do check your blood sugar and enter it into the app, you get a point. And eventually you can cash in those points to get an iTunes download. Who doesn't want music? In order for doctors and insurance companies to prescribe this app for you to use and for you to get the credit that you deserve and for the app to work the way it should, we need a clinical trial that proves that the app makes people healthier, just like I know it will. And your funds will help with that. You'll be directly involved with making this clinical study happen, execute, and be published so that all the results can be shared. You're making history by being on the site, by funding things that you think are important. We need to have a clinical trial that proves that having fun, playing games, playing with your app makes you healthier. Let's make diabetes easier by proving that the Endo Goddess app makes you healthier. Okay, so um, then I started an accelerator program, I was chosen for an accelerator program to make my business model better. Um, and the reason that that's important is because that's the best way to, to make change, is to get into the business of healthcare. So I've created real rewards more than just iTunes with glucose checks, and it's called the Indo Goal app. But the Endo Goal app is recording your glucose, earning points, and getting rewarded. But we also have Cooper, the golden retriever, that is based on game dynamics. And every time that you feed Cooper, or every time you check your blood sugars, you get to feed Cooper. And if you don't, then Cooper does not get to eat. And this motivates people. And it's based on appointment dynamic game mechanics theory. And this is the Tamaguchi digital pet, if anybody ever had one of those. And the Tamaguchi digital pet used to die, but I found out that it's way too traumatizing to make Cooper die. So Cooper just can't eat. And, he, and he'll send you reminders that says, please feed me. And so then you have to interact with the app. And it provides plenty of education as well, based on BJ's uh, health behavior model. And it provides reminders and triggers again. And also now Cooper is reminding you, because Cooper wants to eat. And then you also get different rewards, so it expands, because iTunes were motivating for teenagers, but not motivating for everybody. So if you work in a corporate program with Endo Goal, then you get a health savings account discount. But if you don't, then you get to the same kind of business model with Amazon where you get your friends and family to donate money. So there are two users, a consumer user and a corporate user. The consumer program, the peers and family give you the support. And we're working with Groundwork Group, who does a lot of the back end for all of the um, breast cancer runs and um, diabetes runs in our community, so that it's the same. They hold the money, and they know how to do the process of it. And then the corporate program is basically the employers will pay the employees by deposits in their health savings account. So we're talking to several large employers in our area. And the way that we make a living is that the corporate programs pay us per user per month a fee. And, that's, and we give them analytics about what's happening with their employees, but it's de-identified. So just a quick demo. Let's say that it's time for bed, and I check my blood sugar. It's 105. My doctor tells me I need to eat 30 grams of carbs because I tend to go low or have a low trend in the night. So I get my 30 grams, and I give my three units of insulin, and it's 10 o'clock, and then I submit my recording, 
and then it's the end of the day and I, Cooper gets a bonus bone and he barks actually on the app. So then I go back to the home page and what I can see are all of my blood sugars here easily and I can send as an email in the top corner um, that will send as an email to my doctor if my doctor gives me their email address. I can keep track of my points and how I'm going to be spending my points. And this is the reward screen that we're still developing, um, but it'll basically tell me how much money I have left and what I can spend. And in general, when you look at competitive analysis of lots of different companies that are doing diabetes things, we're the only ones that are doing reward programs. So it's kind of a new idea for healthcare. So in general, I'm the founder, and my partners are Jeff and Ivan Harper that are of Duet Health. And then I have an advisor, business advisor, that's in the banking industry. Banking and healthcare actually are pretty similar in that they're dealing with delicate things, health and money. So investors, we have several investors that have allowed us to get to the point that we're at. And we're talking to several different companies, mostly banks and companies, insurance companies that are in Columbus, Ohio, as well as Goodyear and Akron. Um, they really want to do lots of interesting things for diabetes. So in general and in conclusion, uh, Endo Goal is real, re real rewards, real results. And it's available in the App Store for Android and uh, for iPhone. And you can check out our website. But in conclusion, even though this is a talk about technology, really the most exciting breakthroughs are when you figure out what it means to be human and integrate that together. So that's the answer always. And this is a picture of me when my dad caught me making a to-do list in the middle of the night. I've always been weird and obsessed. <laughs> so this is my email. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank <laughs> you.